How difficult can you make the classic RPG Earthbound? Well, today we're going to find out. The rules of this run are very simple. At no point in the run, either during a battle or in the overworld, can I use PSI moves, have any equipment equipped, or use any normal item. There are many key items needed in order to progress the game, things such as the key needed to enter the first sanctuary location. Obviously we can't beat the game without those, I'm talking more about common items like a hamburger or a skip sandwich. PSI teleport is also required in multiple places throughout the game, so in order to actually beat the game this is allowed. Lastly, under no circumstances whatsoever can I use any save states. This run took quite a bit of time, so if you like what you saw I would really appreciate a like, and if you're new here, feel free to subscribe. But without any further ado, sit back, relax, and enjoy the ultimate Earthbound run. The run starts out just like you would imagine, losing our first battle to a runaway dog. You can also see a death counter in the bottom right. Expect this to jump up just about every single time I cut. Anyway, we're expected to have the cracked bat here, and most players will also bring along King for a little bit of extra damage. We decided to let King chill in the house because we are going to be doing a setup to skip the Starman Jr. fight. This is just to avoid Buzz Buzz using PSI's shield, and while this is supposed to be a required use of PSI, we can actually get around it. All we have to do is first get to really low HP, about one hit away from death. Then we need to lure an enemy to around this spot, because after we recruit Buzz Buzz, no more enemies will spawn, so we need to keep this guy loaded. Lastly, we encounter the enemy, preferably with a bad start to the battle, and then die. We're then sent back home, and with Buzz Buzz in the party, we can go next door and progress the game. Here's where the run truly begins, as we start the grind to beat the first boss, Frank. As you can probably imagine, this is a very tedious process, made even more frustrating by the fact that we can't even grind on the sharks yet. We have to start by grinding on the low XP animals by our house, which takes a pretty good amount of time. Eventually we get strong enough to take the sharks on, and this speeds up the process greatly. The hotel is really close to Frank, so we are able to grind on the higher XP enemies much faster. After a good deal of grinding, we're ready to take on Frank. Ness turbo clutched in this battle thanks to the rolling HP feature, where attacks don't immediately take away the full number of HP. Even though Ness took fatal damage, the numbers hadn't rolled down to zero, allowing us to get off one more attack, which was a smash attack, winning the battle. Because that last attack killed, we're rewarded with 1 HP so we don't technically lose the battle. But naturally, we don't beat Frankenstein Mark II with only 1 HP. Frankenstein isn't too bad though, we beat him first try with full HP. We are rewarded with the key to the first sanctuary location, and the grinding on our first run, as I like to call them, starts. One of the most challenging obstacles we must overcome in this run is the fact that we cannot heal before our boss, meaning it is almost guaranteed that we will not be at our maximum health whenever we fight one. We must do a combination of two things in order to beat them. We have to become so overleveled that we can deal with the random encounters while taking a minimal amount of damage, and we have to get lucky. This was a pretty long run for this early in the game, and that made this a decently long grind, as a major factor contributing to how much health we have whenever we go against a boss is the distance between the nearest save point and that boss. But after fighting countless rowdy mice, attack slugs, and black antoids, we finally reached the titanic ant with a decent amount of HP. We start by taking out the antoids in the back. Usually we have PSI rocket at this point, but it's not that big of a deal. The titanic ant only has a couple moves, one of which is the best move in this entire run, PSI magnet. All this does is steal PP from us, but since we don't use PP anyway, this is a completely free turn for us. The ant can also lower our defense, but in a battle this short with this small amount of HP, it really doesn't matter that much either. With a bit of luck, we're able to take down the ant and get the first of 8 melodies needed to beat the game.
The sanctuary bosses also use the funny meme song, so that's always cool. We have one more piece of business to attend to before we leave the first town of Onnit, and that is we have to fight the police. Because we were trespassing in the cave, Ness, a 13 year old boy, is jumped by five fully grown police officers. If you've never played Earthbound before, this game is crazy, and just you wait, we are only getting started. This is normally a rather difficult section because you have to fight all five officers back to back with no breaks in between to heal. This doesn't affect us at all though, because the challenge of not being able to heal is present throughout the entire game and not just here, so it's really no different than any other battle. Ness is already up to level 17 after all the grinding we did for the ant, so we're able to take down the cops on our first try. Ness turbo clutched here again, getting the same 1 HP victory we got against Frank against the final cop, Captain Strong. With the cops and Captain Strong being dealt with, we're now able to make it to the second town in the game, Tucson. Tucson is where we really need to start doing a lot of things to progress, and I'm going to try and get through them pretty quickly. I don't want this video to just be me beating bosses over and over and over again, but this is no walkthrough, so we're going to try and speed through things. We quickly talked to the Orange and Apple Kids, with Apple Kid allowing us to progress many times throughout this run. We then go over and take on Everdread, who's not too bad. He has two non-damaging attacks, so he's really no issue. We then sleep at a hotel and receive a message from a mysterious girl named Paula, who will very soon become the second member of our party. With that message, we can start the journey to Happy Happy Village, which is going to be a rather difficult one. This is the farthest run we've had to deal with by far, and the enemies we have to deal with are becoming a lot more difficult. The rambling evil mushroom can make us grow a mushroom out of our head, which makes our controls in the overworld all wonky. It's not the worst thing in the world, but it's pretty annoying, I can't lie. But the real danger here are the robots, as they can make us catch a cold. A cold in this run is basically a death sentence, as you take damage every turn in battle and take damage in the overworld. With no way to heal, it's basically a countdown to our death. So getting this early in a run stops it pretty quickly. After stopping back in Tucson and getting the pencil eraser item from the Apple Kid, we were able to make it all the way to Happy Happy Village. The village is one of many very memorable locations throughout the game, and we will spend a good amount of time here. First things first, we need to go find Paula, and she gives us the Franklin badge. This allows us to go back to the village and take on the cult leader. Did I tell you this game was crazy already? After fighting a bunch of, um, unique looking enemies, we start the fight with Car Painter. The Franklin badge that is required to start this fight also deflects the crashing boom bang attack, which deals damage to Car Painter. This seems way too much like using an item to me, and while I guess you could argue that it's a required part of the fight, I just reset until I beat him without him hitting me with the attack. This didn't take too long either. On my 6th attempt, I beat him at level 20. He's revealed to be under the influence of the evil Manny Manny statue. I hope that's the last time we have to deal with that this run. We are rewarded with the key to Paula's cell, and Paula officially becomes our second party member. Paula is initially very weak, and you're expected to use your strong PSI moves to compensate for that. The second sanctuary location is right here in the village, so this is a perfect place to train Paula up. While training in this section, the Mighty Bear became the enemy I lost to the most so far, defeating me 28 times. But eventually, we're able to take on Mondo Mole. Ness is now level 30 and Paula is all the way up to level 21. But at this point though, you can see she is still only doing 2 damage compared to Ness's 58. She's honestly pretty useless and mostly just used to block attacks for Ness, but she does have a couple major moments to shine. Ness clutches with a massive smash attack with only 3 HP left, and we collect our second melody.
After returning to Tucson, we only have a few things left before we can go to the next town, Threed. Side note, I love the fact that they didn't even try with this town name, just adding a D at them is perfect. Everdread gives us a wad of bills for rescuing Paula, and we use that to pay the debt of the Runaway 5 jazz band. We do this because the tunnel leading to the next town is full of ghosts, and that's just Earthbound at its finest. After listening to an absolute banger, we get into the tour bus and we're off to the zombie infested town of Threed. Threed is another extremely memorable location for me, carried by an amazing dark and haunting background theme. After making our way to the back of the graveyard and encountering two zombies that are blocking our path, we go back to the hotel and are led in by a very strange looking lady. We are led directly into a trap and wake up in a room that we cannot escape from. Just like she did with the nest before, Paula telepathically talks to a boy from Winters named Jeff. Just like Paula, Jeff is extremely weak to begin with and will be even more useless than Paula throughout the rest of the game. While Paula was made to use PSI to make up for her stats, Jeff is made to use items, which we also can't use. He also can't use PSI at all normally, so that downside in the normal game also doesn't affect us here. Training Jeff is astronomically more difficult than Paula was because we don't have Ness to do all the heavy lifting for us. The variety of enemies is also way worse in Winters, being the low XP spiteful crows and runaway dogs from the very first area in the game. We also have the enemy that I lost to the most in this entire run and actually never ended up beating here, that being the Gruff Goat which defeated us 56 times here. Eventually we get strong enough to make it to the cave across the lake, and we just have one more hurled across before we can do some real training. We have to make it to the phone at the end of the first room, but the enemies in here are still too tough for us to defeat. We get a couple clutch runaways and we're able to secure the save point at the phone. We can now train on the attack slugs here which give us way more XP than the previous enemies, and later on we can also consistently defeat the rowdy mice. We still have a bit more grinding to do before we can make it out of this cave, but the hard part is finally over. We eventually make it to our father's lab and he lets us take the Skyrunner out for a ride. While we don't exactly make a smooth landing, we crash into the same room that Ness and Paula are trapped in. Jeff has a key item called the Bad Key Machine, and using this allows us to get free of the trap. We can finally escape and continue on our journey with three party members. Now that we have Jeff and Threed, we have a lot of work ahead of us before we can leave for the next town. First things first, we have to take care of the boogie tent. This battle isn't too bad, but the tent does have PSI Flash, a move that can make us cry which lowers our accuracy greatly for the rest of the battle, so that's pretty annoying. But on the fourth attempt, we were able to take it down, so again, it's not really that bad. We collect the jar of fly honey, which will become very important later, and Applekid sends over his brand new invention. This is the zombie paper, and using this in the tent traps all the zombies in Threed, including the ones that were stopping us earlier. We will now begin the long run to the Saturn Valley, but this will be filled with a lot of very difficult enemies and even a boss. We can catch a cold, we can be made to cry, we can be poisoned, and we can even be possessed. There are many different status effects that can hit us during this run, so making it through with a good amount of HP is going to take some time. Side note here, some of you who have already played through this game might be wondering how we have enough money to constantly revive people this much. But the way we actually earn money is based on how much XP we gain. Because all we are doing is battling during these sections, our dad will always send us enough money to keep reviving party members. Also, it's not like we're buying items or equipment, so we save a pretty good amount of money there. Anyways, we eventually make it to the next boss, the Mini Barf. The main challenge in this fight was the run before it, but the Mini Barf does have a couple annoying moves. It can make all three of us cry at once, freeze party members for a turn, and even lower our stats. 
Paul and Jeff are still only doing 1 HP per attack, with Paula being level 25 here and Jeff being level 23. Ness is up to level 35, and he's able to carry us to victory on attempt number 5. We still have one more small stretch to go, and there's some pretty tough enemies here at the end. But we can do some spawning manipulation to get around them. This is a technique where you deload enemies as soon as they spawn by running out of range, and going back to the point until the enemy doesn't spawn there anymore. Some places are easier to do this in than others, and after a long run I'm fine using it here. And after one last roach infested tunnel, we finally make it to the Saturn Valley. The Saturn Valley might just be the most memorable location in this entire game, second maybe only to on it. The goofy music and the way the Mr. Saturn's talk screams Earthbound, and even earn them the honor of becoming an item in Smash. But right after the valley, we have one of the biggest Earthbound moments in the entire game. We have to go behind this waterfall and not touch the controller for three minutes straight. But you want to know how long you have to wait here? Three whole minutes. I'm dead. Focus cut. Serious. After making it in, we have one of the largest hurdles in this whole run. And the run before it isn't even that bad. The enemies outside are still pretty strong, and the slimy little piles can make us cry. But the fobbies are free XP and a great way to grind some levels, which we will desperately need for the next boss, Master Belch. If you've played through this game before, you probably remember your first time fighting Belch and not just for his design. The way the Belch fight works is that any damage done to him will instantly be healed unless we use the jar of fly honey that we got from the boogie tent. After this, the fight is basically free, definitely one of the easiest in our normal playthrough. So this makes the jar of fly honey a required key item, right? Well, not exactly. After reading through a bunch of 15 year old game forums, I found that there's actually three different ways that you can beat Belch without the fly honey. The first way is using PSI Flash Beta, which actually has a 1 in 8 chance of instantly defeating any enemy, not just Belch. Next is using Jeff's HP Sucker item to slowly chip away at Belch's health, but the only one we can actually do is much, much more tedious. We have to use Paula's Prey ability, an ability that has 10 possible outcomes that can either help us or hinder us. What we need to happen is we need Paula to pray and make everybody feel strange. Then, we need Belch to blow his nauseous breath at himself, making himself nauseous and doing about 20 damage per turn. All we have to do from here is survive long enough for Belch's 650 HP to run out, and then we'll have beaten Master Belch without the fly honey. Ness and Jeff just defend the whole time, as I don't want to risk doing damage to other party members while feeling strange, and Paula keeps praying for a little bit of HP regeneration. This is actually my second playthrough that I've done for this challenge, but my first playthrough had a couple sections get corrupted so I had to start a new one. But I actually did make it to this part before and defeated Belge, so I know around what level everybody should be at. When we finally defeat him, Jeff's level has doubled to 46, Paula is up to 48, and Ness has climbed all the way to level 61. My first attempt took 91 tries, but luckily this one here only took 15. This battle took nearly 10 minutes to do, and was one of my biggest fears when starting this run again. But it's all over now, and we can move on. After defeating Belch, we can go and fight the third Sanctuary boss, the Trillion Age Sprout, which is no easy fight. The Sprout has two major attacks that we have to look out for, one that can make a party member numb, and the other one can diamondize a party member. A numb party member can only be healed at a hospital in this challenge, so all you can do is wait to be taken out. And diamondizing a party member instantly defeats them. Meaning if the last party member alive gets hit with either one of these attacks, we will instantly lose. I thought this fight would take way longer honestly, and I can't believe we only defeated it in 5 tries. The Sprout does have our old friend PSI Magnet as an attack, 
and we get lucky here with the sprout using it way more than normal. This was a very welcome change of pace after the hours spent trying to take down Belch, but with the sprout defeated, we can collect our third melody and journey back to the town of Threed. After the defeat of Master Belch, all the monsters terrorizing Threed are now gone, which admittedly gives us a very boring town again. This includes the ghosts that were blocking both tunnels, allowing us to finally move past Threed. Through the second one is the desert, and all we have to do right now is give this worker some food so we can continue his job, but we're going to be coming back to him very soon. We just have a little bit farther to walk, and after crossing the scenic bridge, we enter the big city of Foreside. Foreside has a whole lot for us to do, first of which is seeing the Minches. Our next door neighbor, Pokey from the beginning of the game, and his father are living the life of luxury near the top of Monotoli Tower. We can talk to both of them and all they really do is just flex their wealth on us and admit that they've never liked Ness or his family. And after getting an earful from both of them, we hop over to the Top Ola Theater to hear the Runaway Five perform another banger. After talking to their new manager, we find out that they are one million dollars in debt and they could really use our help. We are taunted to go find some buried treasure, but after a good night's rest at the hotel, we can return to the desert and see what the digging crew has found. And as it turns out, what they found is actually our next dungeon. Pretty convenient. We are told that they can't continue their work as there are five huge mole enemies lurking in the cave, so naturally we have to defeat them so the workers can keep going. But the moles are actually not the greatest challenge in this section, it's the enemies leading up to them which is going to give us the most amount of trouble. There are thirsty coil snakes and gigantic ants which can poison us, and the ants also have a paralyzed attack, so that's not very fun. In this run, you could consider being paralyzed and being numb the same thing, as there's nothing we can do except for go to a hospital. There's also an enemy in this cave called Noose Man. Here's what he looks like. Um, I really hate to say this. I think there's someone hanging right there. I'll take a quick second to remind you guys that this game is rated E for everyone. Well, until the Wii U changed it to a T rating 18 years after the game came out, but that's a whole nother thing. Anyway, we start chipping away at the five bosses, all claiming to be the third strongest mole in the cave and giving us this pretty cool background. Again, they aren't too bad. We actually never ended up losing to one of these guys. We always got taken out by the enemies before them. With all five of them out of the way, we start heading back to Foreside and we're stopped by one of the workers from earlier. He gives us a fat diamond, and just like we did back in Tucson, we pay off the debt of the Runaway Five and can immediately go to the next dungeon. One of the first things many players do when entering a new city is run straight to the department store, but you can't do that here in Foreside as a mysterious voice blocks you from entering. After paying off the debt of the Runaway 5, we can enter the department store, and you're probably wondering what we have to do here in this run. After paying off the debt of the Runaway 5, we can enter the department store, which we actually have to do in this run, as weird as it sounds. And the reason why we have to do this is because Paula gets kidnapped here, meaning we have to journey on with Ness and Jeff for a little while. The store is now filled with two really strong enemies, the Musical Record and the Musica. The Musica can put us to sleep, a non-permanent status effect where we wake up in a few turns or at the end of a battle, and the Mystical Records can heal other enemies. Both enemies have pretty strong normal attacks, and without Paula to tank a couple hits, we are definitely weaker than we were a few minutes ago. This was another section from my last run which took me quite a while to do, but thankfully this time it wasn't so bad. The strong enemies here are complemented by a really short run that we have to do for the boss, and with some luck, we make it to the department store spook. I had no confidence in beating it this time, as Jeff had already been defeated when we started the fight, but Ness really is that guy. The boss has PSI life up, which is a pain, and uses PSI freeze, fire, and brain shock to attack us. But they don't have an insanely high amount of HP, so after only three attempts, we're able to take him down. Unfortunately, we don't get reunited with Paula just yet, and now we have to leave Foreside for a little bit. Well, 
kinda. Our next stop is the Foreside Coffee Shop, and after talking to a few patients, we see Everdred lying on the ground outside. He tells us to check behind the counter at the cafe, and doing so leads us into Moonside. Moonside is a backward city, where yes is no, Kanye is bad, and paintings attack you. It's another short but very memorable area, and there's a very short run we have to do before the next boss, the evil Manny Manny. This is a very tough fight. The statue is PSI Paralysis, and it can emit a glorious light, which has a 55% chance of instantly defeating a party member or paralyzing a party member. Jeff gets paralyzed here in the first turn, but even though Jeff is up to level 51, he's still only doing 1 damage per attack, so it's really not that big of a deal. It's much better for him to get paralyzed instead of instantly defeated, because he can still tank a few hits for Ness. The statue tried a handful of times to paralyze an already paralyzed Jeff, which does nothing, and we also got a few PSI magnets in there. We got super lucky here though, only needing 8 attempts, which is way less than it took in my last run. And after winning the battle, we see a broken Manny Manny statue in the back of the coffee shop. I hope that's the last time we have to deal with that this run. Our next order of business is back in the desert, in a hole filled with monkeys. There are two monkeys each asking for a different item, and if you give it to them, they'll let you pass and you'll find two more monkeys. This section is rather tedious, and the cave can be simplified to look like this, and I'm using simplified kinda lightly here, but after a lot of trading and making it to the back of the cave, we meet a monk who promises to teach us a special power, and we also find a yogurt dispenser, which we'll be using here in just a minute. A monkey then meets us outside and teaches us PSI Teleport Alpha, a fast travel system that's not really that good right now. I mentioned at the beginning of the video that this is an ability that's required in multiple sections, so it's fine for us to use, but I'm going to be trying my best not to spam it all over the place. This ability is pretty bad right now because it needs a long straight line for us to pick up speed, and in pretty much every section of the game this is kind of hard to find. But with the Yogurt Dispenser and PSI Teleport, we're able to go back to Foreside. We are finally on our last bit of Foreside stuff for quite a while, and we're going to be returning to the Monotoli Tower. We give the Yogurt Dispenser we just got to this worker here so she can make trout flavored yogurt, which just sounds amazing, and she lets us up to the top floors. There's a handful of robot enemies up here, but they aren't the worst thing in the world along with the boss who also isn't too too bad. The clumsy robot we have to fight can fire missiles which can hit both Ness and Jeff in the same turn for quite a bit of damage, but that's pretty much all it can do. It has a lot of moves which do literally nothing, like cleaning the area or wanting to go and get a battery, but after two tries we're able to defeat it. While still in the battle, the Runaway 5 show up and flip the off switch on the robot's back, which wins us the battle. We then walk into the next room and learn that Mr. Monotoli has been under the influence of the evil Manny Manny statue, but his mind has been freed and at long last we are reunited with Paula. And right before we leave, Pokey calls us a world class loser from his helicopter, and the Runaway 5 take us back to the town of Threed. Upon returning to Threed, we immediately go back to the Sky Runner. Jeff fixes it up and takes us back to Winters, but this time we have Ness and Paula with us. We land back in the lab and we can go back to the cave that Jeff was grinding in earlier and fight the fourth sanctuary boss, Shroom. Shroom feels much easier than the last few bosses, mainly because we have Paula back. This isn't really the case though, she's still only doing one damage, but at least she can act as another shield for Ness again. Shroom has PSI life up and can either poison us or give us a mushroom, naturally. Ness actually hit himself with a smash attack here out of confusion, doing a massive 460 damage, but his HP is so high that we were able to take out Shroom before our HP got anywhere close to zero. After only two tries, we were able to collect our fourth melody, and we can now travel to the sunny beach town of Summers.
Jeff's dad was working on the Skyrunner during our last fight, and it's now able to take us to Summers. This town always gives me trouble. It's pretty big, and I can just never remember what I'm supposed to do when I first get there. Just to go over it quickly here, we've gotten a reservation at Club Stoic, and while we were in there, we talked to a lady who offered us some magic cake. After taking some and making the screen go all crazy, Ness begins to have an even crazier dream. He dreams of a powerful prince from the far off land of Delam. Delam has an amazing look and soundtrack to it, and is home to Pooh, our fourth and final party member. Unlike Paula and Jeff, Pooh isn't completely useless when it comes to dealing damage, and he will be an extremely valuable member of the team. But before any of that, we are asked to do some private meditation. We are then treated to possibly the craziest fight in this entire game, or at least one of them. Pooh has his legs broken and then his arms. Without any HP, we have our ears cut off and our eyes stolen from us. In a dark void, we hear the spirit communicate with us directly into our mind, the only thing we have left, which the spirit then steals. But after that's over, we return to the palace and receive a few levels, then teleport to Summers, officially joining the team, already at level 18. Pooh comes to us with a tiny ruby on him, this lets us get past the man on the top floor of the museum. Pooh can decipher the hieroglyphics for us on this stone tablet, and on our way out we pick up the phone to hear the Foreside Museum. Something amazing is happening there, and they want someone to come see it. We can teleport back to Foreside really easily from Summers, as this red was practically made for teleporting. Back in the Foreside Museum, we can already go to the 5th Sanctuary location. Pooh is still extremely underleveled, but this is a perfect spot to train him up. Pooh is perfect for this type of challenge, with his gimmick being that he can't normally equip items except for a very specific few that are very difficult to attain. He has strong normal attacks, and he's the only character that we'll be using in this challenge the same way that most people do, at least for the most part. Eventually we make it to the Plague Rat of Doom, and we have another crazy lucky fight here. Pooh is up to level 35, but his attacks are still only doing 1 damage. Throughout the course of this fight though, we land 7 smash attacks, 4 of them coming from Ness who's up to level 71. The rat took a few tries, but we were still in the process of training up Pooh, so I'm fine with it only taking 9 attempts. We go up this ladder here to receive the care key, and we're also rewarded with our fifth melody. And with the care key now in our inventory, we're heading back to Delam. Delam holds the next sanctuary location, and again we can immediately go and get it. There are three rabbit statues outside this cave that used to be blocking our path, but the care key allows us to go inside. There's a relatively short run here, but the enemies are a huge pain, and pretty weird but that's kinda expected at this point. The Tangu can put you to sleep or poison you, the Thunder Mites have PSI Thunder, naturally, the Conducting Menaces have PSI Thunder and Flash, both of which can instantly take out a party member. And finally, the Kiss of Death, a giant pair of floating lips which can also poison us. All the possible status conditions made getting a good start on the boss rather difficult, meaning most attempts were doomed right from the start. But after a while, we finally have a good start against the boss, Thunder and Storm. First things first, for some reason, Thunder and Storm used the music of the next boss and not the normal Sanctuary meme song. I have no idea why, but it does kind of slap though.
Thunder and Storm have both PSI Flash and Thunder, meaning we have three statuses to deal with along with the threat of instantly being defeated. They can also do over 400 damage in one attack, but they have to waste a turn and charge up before they can use it. Jeff and Paula are doing 1 damage per attack as usual, but Pooh is doing around 65 damage at this point. He's up to level 57, Jeff and Paula are at 65 and 64 respectively, and Ness is all the way up to level 80. Ness hit 2 smash attacks here for about 400 damage each, and Pooh also hit one for about 300. These attacks gave us the victory after 17 attempts, and we can go on and collect the 6th melody. Unfortunately though, that's all we have to do here in Delam, and we're heading back to Summers. We don't stay in Summers long though, we actually leave as soon as we get back here. We are now able to cross the sea over to Scaraba, but we have to fight a Kraken on the way. This is the boss fight that Thunder and Storm were taking the music from, again, no idea why. Second, we got extremely lucky here. On the first turn, Paula started feeling strange and everyone else started crying. The Kraken can also use PSI Fire to hurt everyone at once, and PSI Thunder just for good measure. Paula attacked Ness twice out of confusion here, doing 221 total damage. We would have lost this fight, but Pooh survived on 1 HP thanks to a mechanic I've not yet explained. There's a small chance of surviving any mortal damage, and that grows higher with your guts level. Right now, Pooh has a 4% chance of surviving mortal damage, and fighting through tears, Pooh clutches up and we win on our first try. We then land at Scaraba and can keep on rolling. There's a pretty long run to the next boss, but thankfully we only have to do it a few times. Once we reach the Sphinx out here in the desert, we enter the code from the Summers Museum and we can gain access to the Pyramid. Enemies in here can poison us or give us a cold, so making it all the way to the boss should have been a lot more difficult than it ended up being. After making it all the way to the end with a decent amount of HP, we face the Guardian General. The General is a pretty standard boss, it can lower someone's attack and defense but other than that it can't really do anything. It also has a turn wasting move so overall not too bad, it only took us 3 tries. But immediately after leaving the pyramid, someone known as the Star Master whirls in and takes Pooh away for some training. This is so Pooh can learn PSI Star Storm. So that's pretty annoying considering we can't use that anyway here. We have to go on for a bit of man down, and losing Poo is a lot worse than it was when we lost Paula a little while ago. But just up ahead we reunite with somebody who I forgot to mention earlier. This is Brick Road, the man who made the maze that Jeff trained in when we first unlocked him. He's turned himself into Dungeon Man, a full on sentient dungeon with a very interesting soundtrack. The dungeon itself isn't too bad, and doesn't take too much time to get through. After making it out, we walk around with him for a little bit before he gets stuck because he's, you know, huge. We do one more run through the dungeon, and find an old submarine, just the thing we need to keep on moving. We take the sub over to the Deep Darkness, a forest filled with stronger versions of previous enemies. There are elder oak trees, even slimier little piles, hard crocodiles, and even pit bull slugs. There's even a big pile of puke, a recolored master belch fight, but thankfully without all that fly honey nonsense. They're all just recolored enemies with stronger moves and more HP, but they do put up enough of a fight to make this area no walk in the park. We end this area with a boss fight against another belch reskin, this time being the reincarnation of the original Master Belch himself, Master Barf. And yeah, there's a whole bunch of gross stuff in this area, but in this game's defense, it was the 90s, and I'm pretty sure they loved all that stuff back then. Only the 
Thankfully, Barf doesn't have any of that fly honey shenanigans either, so we can fight him just like normal. He has the same moves, he can make us nauseous or make all three of us cry, but not relying on praying makes this fight so much easier. On our fourth attempt at the end of the battle, Pooh comes in and uses PSI Starstorm to finish the fight. This is a scripted use of PSI that we cannot get around, and it's more of something that just kind of happens instead of us choosing to use the move, so it's fine. We just have a little more to go until we find a cave filled with strange little creatures completely overcome with shyness. You can't blame these little guys, honestly. They just don't know how to talk to people. We are tasked with finding a special book to help overcome shyness, which, side note, would definitely be a like New York Times bestseller if it was real. After getting this mission, we leave the cave and hear from our old friends, the Orange and Apple Kids. Apple Kid has been working on an eraser eraser machine, to go with his pencil eraser machine, of course, but something happens to him while we're on the phone. We then hear from Orange Kid, who interrupts his work of turning a boiled egg back into a raw egg. He tells us Apple Kid has been kidnapped, and he has the shyness book that we're looking for. The last place he was seen is the lab in Winters, so that's where we're headed now. You might have seen earlier that there's a mini Stonehenge outside the lab, in the middle of it there's a hole that leads to the next dungeon. In the lab, Apple Kid's mouse gives us the eraser eraser machine, which allows us to progress through the dungeon. This is one of, if not the longest runs in the entire game, and naturally the enemies here are a real pain to deal with. There are many enemies here who can hurt every party member with a single attack, slowly chipping away at everybody's health, including the atomic powered robot, which is guaranteed to explode and hurt everybody once it's defeated. We can also be diamondized by the mooks, which is always a fun addition to a run. This is all pretty annoying, but again the main difficulty here is just how long the run is, so surviving all the way till the end with a decent amount of HP is a pretty big pain. Eventually when we do make it to the next boss, the Starman Deluxe, Ness and Pooh are the only ones who made it there, and neither one of them are at their max health. The main attack we have to look out for is PSI Starstorm, which hits every party member. We got hit with this with Ness and Pooh both very close to dying, but Ness, the legend, hit a smash attack on 2 HP and won us the battle on our first try. The Starman Deluxe had 1400 HP, and Ness hit 2 smash attacks doing a combined 900 damage in just 2 moves. Not gonna lie, I was extremely thankful that we only had to do this run once, but now that the boss is defeated, we can free everyone who is captured. Applekid tells us he returned the book to the Onnit library, so we quickly pop over there, grab it, and go back to the deep darkness. After giving over the book to overcome shyness and having that life-changing information share with everybody, we can talk to this little guy who moves a stone that was previously blocking our path. There are a few stronger versions of previous enemies here again, including the Fobbies. There's still free XP and a pretty good source of it too, but here they come with this really cool unique background for no real reason. We also have to deal with a stronger version of the Conducting Menace from Dalam here, but overall this area isn't too bad. Not too far into the cave though, we find our 7th Sanctuary Guardian, the Electro Spectre. For some reason, the Kraken fight music is playing here again, despite the fact that the Spectre is also a Sanctuary Guardian, so I, I really don't know what's going on here. The Spectre has two useless moves for us here, removing a shield from a party member, and removing all PSI effects from battle. That's pretty nice considering that's half of its moveset. Ness is level 91 here with over 700 HP, and Pooh is not too far behind him damage-wise at level 71. We also got the Spectre on our first try, and after reading the wall in this cool looking room here, we collect our 7th Melody. We're really in the home stretch now. 
We're down to three bosses left and we only have one more melody. The room we were just in drops us into the Lost Underworld, a huge area which makes us really small and really slow. We also have to frequently stop here thanks to earthquakes, which does make moving around here really tedious. There are also huge dinosaurs down here and whatever this is supposed to be, but thankfully we're small enough to get around them most of the time. About halfway through this place there's a phone, and from there we can make it to the next area without taking any damage. Most of the time we can just avoid enemies altogether, but if we do take damage we can heal up before the dreaded Fire Spring. The Fire Spring poses a serious challenge to us, and mostly that's the extremely difficult boss at the end. But before we get there, we have to fight our way through some of the toughest enemies in the entire game. We can be possessed and paralyzed, but like the run from the Stonehenge area, the main thing we have to look out for here is the enemies being able to attack everybody at once. Most enemies here can hit all four of us with a single move and they're all very strong. And that's a major problem considering the boss we have to deal with. I also did do a good amount of training here before the boss. Getting Paula up to level 84, Jeff up to 88, and Ness and Pooh hit the max level of 99 before this fight. But eventually we're able to take on our final sanctuary guardian, the Carbon Dog. The Carbon Dog has 1700 HP and can hit everybody in the party with a single, pretty strong attack. Paula and Jeff are finally doing more than one damage per attack here, and Pooh is actually doing more damage than Ness, so that's pretty cool. Ness and Pooh can do about one third of Carbon Dog's health with a single smash attack, so you're probably wondering what makes this boss so difficult. Well, let me introduce you to the second phase, the Diamond Dog. Diamond Dog has a staggering 3,344 HP and some pretty devastating attacks. When the fight starts, the dog has a shield, which halves the damage it takes and reflects it back on us. This lasts for three turns, and the dog can put up the shield at any point throughout the fight. Naturally, we can be diamondized, and the dog can emit a glorious light, which just in case you forgot, can either make us cry, feel strange, paralyze us, or instantly defeat us. Our only saving grace in this fight is the dog can howl, which does literally nothing, and gives us a couple turns of free hits. We had an alright start after defeating Carbon Dog, and the team managed to get off 6 smash attacks for over 2100 damage alone. Luck was definitely on our side here, and after only 5 tries we are able to come out with a W. We can collect our 8th and final melody, and now that we have all 8 of them, we can finally hear the song in full. After hearing this absolute banger, Ness is teleported to Magicant, a dream world in his own mind. And yes, only Ness is here for this section, ramping up the difficulty quite a bit. We are able to recruit a flying man here to help us, but they have a limited amount of HP and won't make this a walk in the park by any means. Also I'm not sure what happened to my footage here, I recorded this quite a while ago and I just, I just cannot find this run for the life of me. It's not super important though, there are tough enemies here and the boss room has three krakens in it, but they don't respawn so we take those out one by one. But eventually we hit the penultimate boss, Ness's Nightmare. This is where I stopped my last run, and going into this fight I wasn't even sure if it was possible under these circumstances. Ness is at the max level, and we were able to consistently get to the boss fight with max HP, so the only thing we could do was just pray that RNG would be on our side. Ness's nightmare lives up to its name, with an extremely dangerous moveset. 
and it was PSI Life Up to restore up to 375 HP, PSI Rockin' Omega to do over 600 damage in one single attack, and just for good measure, it can emit a glorious light. We got really lucky here yet again, as the Nightmare only healed one time and never put up a shield. Ness also hit 4 smash attacks here, and that won us the battle after only 10 tries. This was a very welcome relief, because on my last run I did over 100 attempts for this boss and was never able to defeat it. And of course this statue is based off the evil Manny Manny statue. I sure hope that's the last time we have to- After defeating the Nightmare, we receive what's known as the Magicant Boost, but ours is way worse than normal. You're meant to get a big boost to your stats, including HP and PP, along with a crazy amount of XP. But we hit level 99 two bosses ago, so what happens for us? Well, we get some stat benefits, but not HP, attack, or defense. Our vitality stat does go up, and that is what determines what our HP is, but since we can't level up anymore, we actually don't get any benefit from this. The boost usually pushes Ness's HP over 900, so missing out on it is going to make the final boss a lot more difficult. Also, we don't get any PP, but I mean, who cares? But with that out of the way, we only have one last thing to do before we can go to the final area of the game. We need to go back and get a piece of the meteor from the very beginning of the game, but there are a lot of extremely difficult enemies here. They're all a pain, but honestly I'm just gonna skip over this part because the next section is where things get real. The piece of the meteorite we got is needed for the phase distorter, a time machine that'll send us back in time to fight the looming threat of Gygus. Gygus is a mysterious force mentioned throughout the game, essentially an unbeatable, omniscient force that's been controlling many of the evil monsters we've been fighting throughout the game. The only way we can fight Gygus is to go back in time and fight it when it's in a much weaker state. Jeff's dad fixes up the phase distorter with a meteorite piece, and it sends us to the Cave of the Past, a short little area where Pooh learns the final version of PSI Starstorm, and a sample from a Beatles song is playing. into robots so we can safely go back in time. Yeah, pretty crazy. But with all that set, we can go back in time to the final area of the game. Here's where something major happened. A grind unlike anything we've done so far. This took longer than the rest of the game combined and took me months to finally do. Why is this so bad? Well, the fight against Gygus is insanely long and insanely difficult, essentially requiring us to be at max health for even a chance of victory. And how do we do that in a challenge where we can't heal? Well, we have to rely on the runaway mechanic. If you've played this game before, you're probably thinking, man, runaway is such a useless option, it never works. And you're right most of the time, Runaway is pretty bad in this game. But the way it actually works is that it looks at your speed stats. And considering this is the end of the game, everyone is at level 99, so our speed stat is as good as it's gonna get. This table right here shows the percent chance of running away from every enemy, and as you can see, it's a little worse than a coins flip chance for all of them. And what we need to do is run away from every single enemy we encounter from the Phase Distorter to Gygus. But how many tries do y'all think this took? Go ahead and pause the video and put it down in the comments. I'll wait. Alright, what did y'all say? 100? 500? 1000? Well, the actual answer is 10,097. 
This takes into consideration how many times we fought Gygus and lost, which was a pretty good amount, but it took over 10,000 attempts to finally have the run where everything lined up perfectly. And throughout all this grinding, we have to listen to some truly haunting music, which not gonna lie, started to drive me crazy at the end. I also just learned this, but just like the last area, this is actually a Beach Boys sample, if you can believe it or not. But after literal months of nothing but grinding, eventually we make it to Gygus' lair. We go down what appears to be intestines or organs or innards of some kind, and reach the Devil's Machine, where we see Pokey one last time. He's been led here throughout the course of the game by Gygus, and here in the past he puts up his dukes and fights alongside Gygus. In the first phase, Gygus can only use PSI Rockin', which damages everybody in the party and proved fatal many times. He can't take any damage yet, so we have to take out Pokey. Pokey is a real pain, with his worst move being a stinky gas which will lower everybody's attack or defense substantially for the rest of the battle. This phase needs to be done quickly, as these stat lowering attacks can really add up and screw us up later. I'm also back to the strategy of praying with Paula, hoping for some slight HP recovery or even a revive if we're lucky. She is required to win the fight, so if she dies early, it's all over. Eventually we make it to the second phase and we're in pretty rough shape. Jeff is already down and Paula and Pooh are not doing well HP wise. During this phase, Paula revived us three separate times, truly putting the team on her back. Gygus does no PSI flash during this phase, but the healing and revives made this phase possible. Just very stressful and took a long time. Eventually though, we make it to the final phase, the praying phase. All that can damage Gygus now is Paula's prayer, as she calls out to everybody we meet in the future. After a few turns of praying, Gygus turns into this, and even my recording software starts to take some damage. Even I, Hammer, the player, start praying and doing damage. And with one last 22,000 damage prayer, I, as the player, defeat Gygus and complete the ultimate Earthbound run. This was attempt number 45 on Gygus, meaning I made it to him 45 times without taking damage, which is why that number was so high. But with that, we complete the run with 655 total deaths. This project took me quite a long time to complete as well as edit, so I'd really appreciate a like and a subscription if you made it this far and you liked what you saw. I plan on doing more challenges like this, and I'm always open to suggestions either down in the comments or in my Discord. Link is in the link tree. Thank you so much to everybody who made it this far, and as a treat for listening to this boring outro, I'll leave you with this unreleased track in the game files that you might not have heard even if you've beaten the game. Enjoy the rest of your morning, evening, or night, and I'll see y'all next time.